right, welcome everyone. This is uh, obviously a presentation on software testing. So let's dive right in. If I can. All right, so a quick outline. Uh, we're just going to talk about what is software testing, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Why should we test? We're going to give a couple reasons on why this is important. We're going to talk about some different types of software testing out there. How do we find proper inputs and outputs, which is sort of a big part of what software testing is. And on that note, when can we say that we're done with the inputs? Uh, we're going to talk about creating test cases, some general test suite features that most test suites will have in common, some examples of what not to do, and then some examples of real life software testing. So what is software testing? According to Techopedia, software testing is a set of processes aimed at investigating, evaluating, and ascertaining the completeness and quality of computer software. Software testing ensures the compliance with the software product in relation with regulatory, business, technical, functional, and user requirements. So basically, we're just trying to make sure that the software does what we expect it to do. On a high level, you can just think of it as this. We've got our system. We're trying to make a set of inputs and generate an expected set of outputs. So why test? There are two major perspectives that I decided to hit on this topic. Um, one is from a monetary perspective. You can see from the little chart to the right, uh, those numbers aren't going to be exact, but they are estimations. You'll find similar estimations everywhere. The sooner you catch a defect, the less it's going to cost to fix it. And if you think about this logically, if you're still designing the system, catching a defect might be as simple as just erasing a whiteboard and drawing some new lines. If you catch it later when you've already got some code, that's going to mean some fixes. And then those fixes might cause their own errors, which then uh, sort of cascade down into a bigger bigger pool of things. So it's going to be a little more cost to fix those things. And obviously, the more of your system is built, the more it's going to cost to make a fix. From the perspective of a developer, uh, it can also save you a bit of headache by making sure that you're working with functional code. So if you ever wrote some code and it didn't seem to be working, um, it might not necessarily be your fault. There's, there's always a chance that it's something that someone else wrote or something else somewhere down the line is, is actually responsible for. So if you're tearing out your hair over, <laughs> yeah, it's always, it's never your fault. So you're tearing your hair out over uh, something that might not, might not have had to go back. So in terms of types of software testing, uh, there's sort of two broader categories, and I hope I explain these well enough. Uh, these, these are not, you can't say do a black box as do a white box. There are certain types of tests that fall under these categories. So a black box test, if you imagine your software as sort of a box painted black, so you can't see the guts of it, you can't see the functions, you can't see the for loops, the if statements, all the lines of code, all you can really do is check your inputs versus outputs. Um, so, a black box testing really doesn't take any of the guts of the code into account. It just looks at the inputs and makes sure that you get what you expected. So, as, as we see here, it's, it's going to be faster to write these kinds of tests, but it's going to be a little less thorough. Um, and it's not concerned with how the code works, just how it works. White box testing, by contrast, it should almost maybe be called a clear box testing. You can think of it as being able to see into the code and actually design your test cases around the individual functions and lines of codes, control flow. Uh, these are going to be slower to write, but they're going to be more thorough, and they're going to catch some things potentially that black box testing may have missed. A couple examples of some of these tests that are considered associated with black box type testing. Uh, and as you see here on the bottom, it's not so important that you understand exactly which definition is associated with which word. Uh, just understanding the concepts is more what I wanted to get across here. Um, and sort of to exemplify this, some places might use end-to-end -end testing and system testing interchangeably. Uh, so definitions aren't quite standardized across everywhere. But in general, functional testing is going to be more of a narrow scope testing. It's going to be looking at specific functionality. End-to-end -end testing is going to be more of a real-world scenario where you might do something like simulating logging in 
performing a few tasks and then logging out. A system test will test the entire system on a more mechanical basis. And load or stress test is testing the system again, but under different conditions where it has heavy load or heavy stress and seeing how much it can handle. Some tests that are generally associated with white box are unit testing, which is just testing a single component or module. Integration testing, which is testing your module as it works combined with the rest of the application, making sure that it's the inputs it's receiving are what the rest of the application is sending. Uh, regression testing, which is testing after you've added your module, does the rest of the application still work? So maybe your application is modifying a global variable that something else needed. So this is important to make sure that the entire system works continuously. And then finally, security testing, which is going to be a very rugged, thorough testing of can, can your system be hacked. Um, and since we're going over a testing presentation, I thought I'd mention some commonly heard testing types. There's alpha testing and beta testing. Uh, alpha testing is using the product as though it were complete, but it's only being used within the company that made it. So an example of this, a brief example of this was Kona, where at one point it was being used while it was still under development, but only within the developer circle. It wasn't released <laughs> any time. Beta testing is sort of the fun one where you get to try out nice little browsers and games before they're really made. Uh, or before they're really ready for user consumption. So again, testing is designing certain inputs, putting them into, into your system and getting expected outputs, hopefully. But how do we decide the appropriate inputs and outputs? So for an example here for inputs, if we have a numerical input, do we really need to test every single number or every number that an integer could hold? for example. Um, generally, we don't want to do that kind of thing. Uh, it's better, it's a better use of resources to just sort of categorize your numerical inputs and just draw from those categories. Uh, so good examples of categories, just to show what this might look like, is let's try testing a positive number. Let's test a negative number. We'll do a number with a decimal point. We'll try with zero, not a number, etc. Uh, where do we draw these lines can sort of be a tricky question. You might think that you've drawn fair lines with maybe the examples we have above, but maybe there's some line that you didn't consider. Maybe a number of a certain size would break your system, or maybe, uh, maybe it doesn't work with a prime number or something like that. So this is sort of a tricky question, and there's no good answer. You need to know your system well enough to hopefully design your inputs to cover all bases, but again, it's sort of a waste of resources to go through everything, and it's better to just sort of pick from these groups. So drawing your own lines is, is a fairly difficult task to, to go over. But again, as, as we're saying, if number five works, chances are number seven works. So there isn't much sense in writing a second test to test number seven as well. Another good way to look at your inputs, uh, there are levels of coverage that you could go over to sort of score your tests and make sure that you've covered maybe a minimum requirement or reached a certain standard. Some examples of this, um, well, we're going to talk more about some of the examples later, but there are ways to score your tests, for example, using maybe a count of the number of functions that have been executed throughout all your tests versus the number of functions that exist. And if, for example, we couldn't find a way to hit certain functions, we couldn't design certain inputs that would trigger every single function, then that might raise a few flags for us. There's some functions that haven't been called. Maybe there's some dead code there, or maybe we don't, don't understand our system as well as we thought we did. On a similar note to that, how many lines of code have we covered? It's basically the same exact thing. If, if there are certain lines of code that we can't hit, there's a chance that that's some dead code, or maybe we need to review our test. Outputs can also hit some kind of tricky situations. One good example of this is what if there's an output that requires some sort of intensive calculation or a random seed 
which you basically need to run your program again just to determine what the output was supposed to be. Uh, and this is another kind of tricky situation. There's really no good answer to this kind of thing. You just need to do it as well as you can. Maybe you can go into some intensive mathematics, use some probability, and check that your function hits within a certain probabilistic, maybe arbitrarily chosen value. Um, if you're so fortunate as to have a machine that does something similar, you can sort of check your answers against that machine. But then it sort of brings this infinite recursive question of how well was that machine tested and was that machine tested against another machine and how far back did it go? And just as sort of a funny example here, I have a quote from Unit Testing Randomness where someone says, I've seen WinZip used as a tool to measure the randomness of a file of values before. Obviously, the smaller it can compress the file, the less random it is. So there's also a question of how do we find an expected answer when more than one answer seems reasonable? And an example of this might be a square root function. So if I ask a function, what's the square root of nine? Is the correct answer three or is it negative three or is it both? These are all valid answers. So you need to, in these kinds of situations, it seems like the best response is to keep constant communication with the client, make sure that you really understand what everything is supposed to do especially when more than one answer might seem reasonable. So levels of coverage, as I mentioned before, I was going to talk more about this later. Here's one example of finding different levels of coverage. We're going to discuss uh, node, edge, and path coverage. On the right, you see a sample little diagram of a simple function where we start in state zero, we go through some sort of control flow, which takes us either state one or two, and then regardless of which state we go to, we wind up back at three. In node coverage, we just want to make sure, well, the only question that we're observing here is how many nodes have we covered? So we're not looking at anything other than zero, one, two, and three. Edge coverage is going to test transitions between states. So this is the green arrows here. If we cover a certain number of arrows, that's sort of exemplified by which level of edge coverage we're going for. And then path coverage takes both of these into account. So 0, 1, 3, and 0, 2, 3 represent all paths in this, in this diagram. So here's a, an example. There's no control flow here, just to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> this example here is going to represent a simple multiple choice test. We have the state question one, with four potential answers, three of which, three of which will take us to our <laughs> wrong first question state, and one will take us to the right answer. For question two, oh, regardless of which answer we get, we want to move on to question two, where we have another four choices, and again, only one of us will take us to the right answer. So as an example for state coverage, we would only need to run this application twice, once in which we cover every wrong answer and one in which we cover every right answer. So our first run through might look something like this, where we just pick wrong answers and make it the end. In our second run, we'll cover our right answers. You'll notice that not all the green arrows have been covered. So in this case, we've hit every right answer and every wrong answer, and we've checked that every state works properly. But there's always a chance that, for example, in question one, Maybe your answer A or answer C are wired wrong. Maybe they'll take you to the right answer, or maybe they'll take you to the wrong answer for question two. So this <laughs> isn't as thorough as edge coverage might be. So for edge coverage, just as a brief discussion of it, what we want to do in edge coverage is hit every arrow. So we would want to run this application a total of four times, where we pick A for each, for each question, and make sure that we get to our expected state. B for each question, check that we reach each expected state, and so on until we cover every answer. For path coverage, it's going to be a little more complicated, and we're going to have to cover every potential combination of edges. So for just these two questions, you check A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, B, A, B, B, and so on until we've covered every combination. 
in this example, that might not be so important, but in a more complicated system, you might hit different things that you wouldn't have picked up otherwise. Okay, so here's an example about creating test cases. Um, let's say we're testing a simple name input field. What kinds of inputs do we want to test? For one example, we could do an empty string. And this is important because it will cover any sort of null case. Anything that assumes the string has a blank, uh, maybe anything that's hacked into something and does something with that, this will cover those, those cases. Single characters. This is somewhat unique in that in some languages, uh, you can cast this into a char. Um, it's not going to cover very many cases, but still might be a good thing to have uh, to test because, for example, maybe someone tries to, maybe someone forgets that you're doing a string and they try to cast it into a char down the road. Or maybe something in, maybe if you can even keep contact with all the other developers involved, maybe something's done in a library or something where you couldn't contact the developers and tell them not to cast it into a char. So how about a really long string? This is important because it checks for truncation. Um, Intentionally here, I made it go all the way to the end and then one letter down on the next line. This is sort of a UI example. If, if I were to have a string that looks this long, maybe it'll mess something up on the UI. Maybe it'll make something look a little less attractive, something that we need to account for. Or maybe as a more functional example, we're feeding this into a database that's only expecting a string of a certain length to truncate some data. That's something important to look out for. Uh, 27, completely different type. Um, so this, this might handle some sort of type check. Um, and then Steve, just a positive example that checks, does this function even work at all under any circumstances? So another example, here's this one for a for loop where we are checking that we're going to loop through this for loop a certain number of times to find binding null. So num equals zero. This is going to run through the loop zero times, and we're going to test um, what if something breaks if we never go through the loop? Maybe this loop will initialize something, do something that something else needs to down the road. So this is important to check that maybe if we never run through the loop, something will break. Num equals one. This is another kind of special case where maybe we'll expect multiple of something down the road. We'll call like a dot next on something. Um, but we also have a null check, but we never really check through the case where we only have one. So it's maybe less likely to cache something, but it's still a somewhat special case. Num equals minus one. Now, it might be that we already have um, <coughs> zero here, but there's still the case that maybe down the road, someone might change i is less than <coughs> one to i is less than or equal to one. It's not so likely, but it's still possible. I guess it's somewhat realistic, and at least we would have a special case for this. Maybe we'd expect something out of this test case at least and we'll be able to see hey num zero is passed now and num one is not. So again maybe, maybe we're getting into slightly less realistic scenarios, but all tests are valuable to some extent. Um, num equals minus two. This is getting a little bit farther outside the realms of something that we might really want to cover considering the other tests that we already have. So going this far I would say it's probably just more of a waste of resources than anything. And it may have been better to just not spend the time right now. And then num equals five, of course, we loop through the loop multiple times, which is probably our standard expected case. Um, what if this causes something? Maybe, maybe you thought you were concatenating a string this whole time inside the loop, but you're actually just reassigning it each time. And you can see, hey, look, my string wasn't concatenating. It's just equal to us, though we're going through one. So these are some general test suite features. If you're running any sort of test suite, you might expect to find this. Um, it'll run through a series of tests. Hopefully so. Uh, and these tests perform regular tasks involving your code. And eventually assert that a value might be equal to, or not equal to, or greater than, or less than, something to an expected value. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this assertion here. 
Uh, this is not done using a regular if statement. When I was first learning about testing a while back, this confused me why we had to do these assertion statements instead of just doing our own little checks. Uh, there are a number of reasons why we might want to use the assertion. It's provided to us by the test suite, and it's designed to work with it. So it might more cleanly create pass and fail statuses for your individual tests. Uh, it can fail closer to the test itself than if we allow the error to be caught regularly. Maybe you have an error, and it doesn't get caught until a little bit farther down the line. Well, this will catch it a little bit closer, so it can be a little easier to track down what the error is. Um, and it leaves self-documenting code for yourself or for other developers to say, this is what we expect the case to be by this point. There's just a couple more things. Uh, we might have set up and breakdown portions. It's something that's very common to get your test in a certain state before you start testing certain values. Um, and break down, obviously, to get it ready for the next test. Mocking data, where we might need certain things to be in a certain state, but we don't want to build a whole lot of stuff around it. Uh, a good example of this would be a server call, where I don't want to set up a whole server just to test it. Why don't we just mock the call, pretend we hit a server, and return some expected values. And then individual categories of tests, being able to be skipped or disabled, this is important for if you're testing something that might still be under development. Um, but you know you know the test is going to fail if you try to test it right now, but you, you know what is expected to be output given a certain input. So you might want to still write the test but skip it. And what not to do. So it's generally good not to write too many tests which are redundant. Um, all tests are good to some extent, but at a certain point, you're just sort of wasting time and resources. Uh, an example of this might be our negative two test from earlier. Again, it's not necessarily bad to have them, but your time may have been better spent somewhere else. Uh, tests which can change the state of the application. This is a very important one. If you're doing something that might change a variable in broader scope, something global or something somewhere else, it might cause future tests to either pass or fail where they otherwise wouldn't have. And uh, best case scenario, you've got tests on functions that are perfectly fine that are failing, and everyone's scrambling to figure out what went wrong when it was an earlier test that was causing the, area, the error. Worst case scenario, you've got tests that are falsely passing, and you ship a faulty product. And finally, assertions, which test codes, which we're not responsible for, um, things like, can I cast a string into a number? That's really more about the language that you're working in and not the code that you're actually writing. Um, so, you know, really make sure that you're only testing code that can actually be changed. Uh, examples of this might be tests which only seem to test the functionality of the language, again, the library that you're working with, or a browser or OS. And it's important to note that it's good to test your application's uh, interactions with libraries and browsers. Just don't spend time testing the libraries and browsers themselves. It's sort of assumed that those things should already work. And how much code should be tested? So here's somewhere where I was hoping to sort of open up a little more discussion. Um, so two kind of questions to throw out there are, do we need to do unit, uh, unit testing and server testing and UI testing and feature testing and every single type of testing out there? Um, or can we just stop at a certain point? And do we want 100% code coverage? And is this even possible? There are some tests where, or some applications out there where it might be sort of impossible to test every single line of code um, or every single possible input and output combination. Um, I guess integers are sort of limited to some extent, but you know, there's there's a point where it starts to approach infinity of how many tests you can write for a given system. So two things that I brought up that I thought might be important to these questions are, what are the consequences for failure? So if we're testing something medical, like uh, maybe someone's blood sugar level and for a diabetes patient, then it might be a little more important to really make sure that you get all the code covered. Or another good example would be on the airplane's autopilot, um, you really want to make sure that that kind of thing is not going to run into any major flaws. Whereas if you're just testing an iPhone game, then 
it's not such a big deal as having failed. It'll just be a little bit of frustration. Another good question is, what is the complexity of the system? Uh, if it's overly complex, then it might be a little more difficult to approach 100% code coverage. But if it's really simple, that might be a more attainable number. Uh, another, <laughs> on the flip side of that question then is, do I really want to nearly double my development time in just writing all these tests to cover every single possible scenario? So uh, if, if anyone has anything, anyone wants to jump in, maybe Jeff or someone, <laughs> well, that's right. This is where I had lines. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we, we talked about earlier, I was going to say we were this, about uh, in our particular case on Storm, uh, with Delta, we have architectural components that we have application components. We talked about how it also might be important from the uh, perspective of what to test, the importance of testing code that's being used throughout a system. So we have like, UI components in our system, input controls, calendar controls, things like that. So there's a big emphasis, or there will be a big emphasis on making sure those components are heavily tested because we have several application teams all using those core components. So if one of those components starts to fail, many pieces of the system can fail. So that's, that's a consideration, too, is just how, how much reuse is there in the code. Very little reuse, it's kind of a leaf node if you think about it like that, that the coverage you need there is probably less important than on something that's a core component. Right, yeah, and that, that's another good thing to bring up is how important is it to the rest of the application? In most cases, I think testing is just going to boil down to the resources available. It's time and money, right? I mean, unlimited right. time and money means you can do unlimited testing. Right, and, right. I mean, and based on like the, the importance of the, the Prioritization of you know what you need to get something out there quickly or I mean sometimes the client doesn't care like you just get something out there. Mm -hmm. so, I mean the first thing to kind of get chopped is the automated testing. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah unfortunately. More often than not, yeah. <laughs> right, but that's where our our job as yeah. consultants is yeah. important to impress upon a client right. why the importance of it and that cost lies. Exactly. They can forego, they can pay for it now or pay for it later. But again, like again, it goes also goes to the consequences of failure. It's not that the quality system and then we'll buy the product that's supposed to pay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's another good point then too. Uh, I mean, we've run into problems where you know the client doesn't support that enforcement. So, oh, let's use the beta. We use the beta, and then suddenly beta's in production. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, oh, they're causing problems. So I mean, like Jeff said, it's really you know, the consultant to, you know, make sure they understand the importance of the testing in the early phase. Right, so right. To get them to buy in on that. Yeah, you know, that goes back to that, uh, the earlier discussion of why testing is important because the later you catch a defect, the more it's going to cost you to fix it. And if it's already shipped, then it's going to be the most constant. So on our call last night, we were doing a, a debrief of Scrum 7. Seven. There's definitely some tension between the developers and the customers. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's pushing hard. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay. Any other
gets added to the bottom. Yep, verify test, text, value is test. So it's very simple, very quick and easy to write tests in this IDE. Um, no other test suite that I know of has something really similar to this, and it's a good way to handle end-to-end -end testing and sort of go over what a user might do and see how everything works, make sure that it's all still working. Um, On to slightly more advanced stuff. This is Jasmine. So Jasmine is a good way to test uh, different JavaScript stuff. I have here some code to be tested, called code being tested.js. Remember it very easily. Uh, we'll go over, the, the only thing, I mean, I guess we can go over what each of them does. Seven, just return seven. Error, just throws an error. Lazy add goes, ugh, can't someone else do it? And then makes a different function do exactly the same thing. Returns add. And then add will actually add the numbers. Uh, so J uh, Jasmine is set up just so that you know that it's here. We're not really going to go over this too in depth, but you sort of set up the specs through this .json file. And I also have some spec helpers here, but we'll talk more about those later. First, we're going to go over some test examples. So here's some basic tests. Uh, you can see you can group them. You group your individual tests in this describe with its own little description. And then each test has this little it kind of syntax to it. So this is just testing that a test passes. You do nothing and the test passes. That's important to notice that there's, you don't need to actually assert anything in order for a test to pass. No failure is considered a pass. It fails. So here's a brief introduction to Jasmine's expect syntax. We'll talk a little more about that later. Obviously, false is not truthy, so this will return a fail. It skips. Here, the little x here is the most important part. Um, that's sort of the syntax that Jasmine will use to skip an individual test. Here we can see the x used again for describe, and you can skip a whole series of tests. Um, here's a test that will be skipped. You can see it doesn't have an x before, but it'll be skipped anyway because it's within this describe. Uh, so on to some slightly more intermediate tests. Here we're just uh, declaring some variables, and the really important thing to showcase here is the before each and after each functions, which is sort of that setup and teardown functionality we were talking about earlier. Uh, you can see we're assigning a value to foo, and after each test, we're making sure that bar is undefined again. So in our first test, we'll see that we didn't actually do anything to foo in our test. But because of for each, this will be called before each test, foo will be assigned five by this point. So we can expect foo to be defined. Uh, here's one where we are checking that foo is also equal to five, uh, just as a slightly more thorough test than the last one, rather than just checking that it's defined. Um, another thing to notice here is that bar is being set to a string. Lovely little string that made sure that I don't forget. It tells me I'm doing great. That's awesome. I think I'm doing great too. Um, so this is going to test that after each, the bar gets undefined again. The bar is set to undefined. So even though the last thing we did was we set this bar equal to a string, in the very next test, without doing anything, we can make sure that it's undefined, and this will pass. And then here's an example showing that you can also have more than one assertion in a single test. So we're expecting true to be truthy and false to be, false to be falsy, and this test will pass with multiple expectations. So on some slightly more advanced tests, here we're going to actually test the code that I wrote before. Um, you can see we're just bringing it in through this require, and we're initializing test code before each function to make sure that it's always in an expected state and not just undefined. So here we're using a helper right away. So that means that I have to go over helpers. You can see it says that a million, we're expecting this to be way greater than four. Now to be way greater than is not something that came with Jasmine. This is something that I wrote. So we're gonna go here into our little spec helpers. This is where this gets defined in this add matchers, where you can sort of alter Jasmine a little bit so that it's expect syntax will be able to include my own little special test to be way greater than, which is defined by 
a number being greater than the other number plus 100. And since a million is greater than 104, this will pass. Uh, here's a slightly more advanced helper. 2B prime is another one that I wrote just to show that you can have an entire function written into one of our little Jasmine helpers. Uh, so this will return true only if the result is supposed to be prime. Uh, here we're showing an example of why you might ever use Jasmine's dot not. Um, 2B prime, well, you know, before we had in our Jasmine test, we have to be truthy and to be false, to be find or not, to be undefined. But here's something where we don't really have a not example for it. So you can just use this dot not to flip, flip the expected value. Um, code test from another file. This maybe should have been the first one I went over. This is just testing that seven returns seven, which obviously works. Here's an example of testing an error. Uh, you'll notice that it needs to be inside of a function or else your test will actually throw an error. But we can expect that a function performing this kind of task will throw an error. Um, throw the error, I can't let you do that, Dave. Uh, finally, we have an example of a spy. So this is where we're using that lazy ad from before. We can spy on certain functions and make sure that certain things are happening in a certain way, even if we're not doing them directly. So you remember that lazy ad does nothing but call the ad function with the same exact parameters. Well, here, I want to make sure that ad is being called. So I'm going to spy on our test code object. We're going to spy on the ad function. Later, after I test lazy ad, I can expect that ad will have been called with the same exact parameters. So this ad to have been called with one and three can only be performed because of this one. So those are just some examples of some Jasmine code. Uh, here is an example of running it. You just type Jasmine from the proper directory and it'll run. Each little green dot here represents a past test that red F a little difficult to see because of the lighting in here, but there's a big red F there that means failure. And then these little yellow asterisks mean that a test was skipped. Um, and you'll see it'll give examples or it'll give reasoning for things, expected false to be truthy. Um, this was an explicit reason that I gave test was temporarily able to exit. Um, and just because it might be worth mentioning, setting up Jasmine is really easy. You just go to a directory and type Jasmine in it and it'll generate all the files for you. So this is a great example of a way to test certain uh, JavaScript examples. Um, so now just the last test suite example, we're going to go over some JUnit and maybe discuss some of the similarities and differences here. So our function class is the class that we're testing. I wrote just a couple tests here. This one is actually not being tested, so we're going to skip over it. But um, we have our generate char count map. And what this does is it takes in a string and it produces a map of different characters to the number of times that that character had appeared in the string. Even vowels will take in a map very similar to the one output from the previous function. And it will determine whether we have an even number of vowels or not. Uh, finally, we have, much like the one that we had seen before, just a function that does nothing but throw an error. And uh, last but not least, we have a coin flip function that will return either a one or a zero chosen at random. So our first example, this maybe a lot of this will start to look familiar. Uh, we have a test that just fails. This is similar to one of the tests that we had before. One difference here is that we don't have the expect syntax, so I can just throw a failure directly. Uh, we have our error thrower, um, sort of similar to the last one, but again, we, uh, we need to put this in a try catch block instead of a function like before. So this might be a more realistic example of why we might want to use this fail function, why, why it might be useful is that if we're in a certain state, we can say, hey, this state is definitively wrong, and then we can throw a failure in those cases. Uh, here's a blank test. This one's very similar to Jasmine, just showing that you don't actually have to do anything to make a test pass. 
Um, and here's an ignored test, slightly different in that it's the syntax of this, this at ignore, where in JUnit, tests are defined by this at test syntax, and we can skip them with an ignore. Uh, Jasmine, if you remember, you just put an X before the title of the test. So it's slightly similar in that it's done in the function call, but it's slightly different in the way that it's done. So number two, all right, so we're going to go over some of these tests of the actual functions that I wrote here. Um, so just testing, throwing an empty string into our char count map should be equal to an empty hash and we can assert that these two are equal. Now these aren't gonna be the same object in memory, but assert equals is smart enough to determine that these are gonna be similar in value. Uh, testing a single letter, much like we mentioned before, this is just a good test to do overall. So this is maybe more of an example of a test that you might really see or one that you might really wanna write. Um, we're just putting A in and making sure that it's equal to a map with A and a value of one in it. Uh, so we're making sure that we're both the same and we're also showing that you can assert two things in a single test, making sure that both these two are equal and that if you get A, it will be one. So here's a somewhat realistic example of a test that might fail, exactly the same as before, but we're checking that we have 25 A's, which obviously we don't, we only have the one, so this test will fail. Here's an example of testing a string with multiple letters. And it sort of brings up a bit more of a question here. Um, I could have created this letter map in a for loop, but that's exactly what char map is doing. So do there, there's sort of a question there of, is it okay to also generate our letter map in a for loop, since that's exactly what our generate char count map might be doing? Or do we want to do it a different way to make sure that it's it's a more solidly known value. And uh, Jeff's perspective you mentioned earlier is that it really doesn't matter. You can just generate it through a loop anyway. We know that's going to be the same thing. And I think that's sort of my position as well. But it, it might be something to discuss or something to think about. Uh, you'll see also we're just checking a couple extra things. Not only are they equal, not only are they all expected values, but we can also check that the size might be equal. Um, here's another uh, test where we're just testing a number. Uh, how is this similar? How is it different? It's not entirely different. Um, this, this could potentially be cast into a number under certain circumstances, but this might fall under one of those categories of, are we really writing valuable tests right now? Or is this kind of something that we might want to skip? Are we just sort of wasting resources at this point? Uh, and finally, well, Maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Finally, for, for this, this example here, a test on the coin flip. Now, this is how I went about testing it, and it sparked a bit of discussion between Jeff and myself. But what I did here was I kept a count of how many zeros we have and a count of how many ones we have. And I just flipped this coin a million or 10 million, however many that is, times. And we incremented the zero count every time we got a zero and a one count every time we got a one. Um, here's another just quick example to prevent a divide by zero error. If we get zero, we just definitely want to fail out right away, zero to zeros. But I decided to assert true at the end that one minus, the absolute value of one minus this over that was going to be less than a certain arbitrarily chosen uh, probability. So this is basically just testing that the number of zeros and the number of ones we got were similar in count. So if we wound up getting 75% of them were zero and 25% of them were one, then obviously there's a problem with our coin flip. Or maybe if all of them are always zero, then maybe I'm truncating something somewhere. I'm, I'm not doing something properly. So uh, this, this is a way that I would say is okay to maybe test this kind of coin flip. Uh, it was brought up before that, what do you do if this test fails? And that's sort of a good question because this test failing doesn't necessarily mean our function is wrong. It's just within a certain probability. So there's always a chance that maybe it really is 50-50 coin flip and you got a billion heads in a row and zero tails, but everything was functionally proper. I mean, 
the odds are astronomically low, but there's there's always that possibility. So uh, I said, I mean, what what I would do if it fails is I would just run it again. But is is that really a good answer? Is there a better way that we could handle this? And that's sort of a tricky question. I mean, if if anyone uh, open the dialogue here, if anyone has better ideas. If you're testing something, then it has to be deterministic. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're by definition, this is a non. I mean, it's probabilistic. It's not. It's, I mean, for all set purposes, it's non deterministic. So I mean, it, the test. I mean, running it again obviously is not a great way of fixing it. Right? I mean, <laughs> right, you're right. gonna you're gonna have like maybe like a whole continuous integration system hooked up to the end of it, and mm. just run the bill again. Is is not a way to. I mean. That's more kind of troublesome, right? If that yeah, fixes yeah. the test, that's probably like more troublesome <laughs> than 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 like fixing maybe like if you if you want everything to be within ten percent, then your coin flip function has to maintain state, make sure that it keeps track of it, and then keeps stuff within within that that kind of probability. Right? Mm -hmm. So so either you do that or you or you take the test out. Right, right. I, it seems like this is more of a one-time test versus a regression. But I don't know. It, it's hard to say. You 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 could have a random function that was biased, and you and this is probably the only way you're going to find that. Right. So then the fix should be to fix the random function, right? Which means you have to then change the coin flip yeah, class right. to maintain state. I think, I think right. it depends on how you're selling it. Because if you're selling it as an API and you can guarantee that it's always going to have this specific uh, probability, then it's, then it fails. But it's, you're just saying it works most of the time. Then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're all they're all good answers, and they're all, I mean, they're all they're all equally. It's it's really just a big gray area because again, like, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and you might have specifications that say, hey, all right, we need to make sure that this, if we did a billion coin flips, is it going to be within this point oh one? Is it going to be a 50 50 flip? And if you fail that requirement, then you can say, hey, I didn't meet the requirements and see what you can do from there. But, um, oh, yeah, 10, 10 million. Then. And yeah, yeah, but, but there's, there's always the chance that it actually is. Yeah, yeah. There's always that chance that it actually is a perfectly written function and you just got really unlucky. Uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of. It's just an interesting question, I guess, to sort of think about while while going yeah, over. Yeah, that's true. The beauty of the term itself, probability means probability. Mm -hmm. So you can't force that. Right, right. That's not what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, you you might even just want to skip the test altogether and say, hey, this this isn't something that we can really accurately test. Um. Okay. So just really quickly, since I only have like four minutes left. Uh, here's just how you do the before and after syntax here. Uh, setup and teardown is sort of the uh, equivalent to our before each and after each function in Jasmine. Uh, you can see that I'm just printing beginning test, ending test. And those will get printed after each test. Uh, so we have, uh, yeah, this is just testing things that have been set up and torn down. Uh, I just want to use it. Capital letters, which sets in five. Yeah, it's, it's not too important. I'll just I'll just try running this once just to show you guys what it looks like. I'll test suite. This is how you sort of get your set of tests together. You define suite classes and you put all your classes in, and then you can run it. We'll see over here. We'll get a certain number of failures. Uh, fail, failed, skips. These, these were obviously expected to fail. This is expected to fail. Um, in a real test case, you, you probably wouldn't have things that are expected to fail. You probably want to skip them, but I'm just doing this, for example. And here's some guys in the past. Um, if you want to know how to do this without this snazzy little thing here, which you probably should just, just use this because it's really cool. But you can do all this on the command line, just plugging straight into JUnicore and running the classes yourself. Printing out whether they pass or not. So you can hook into that if you need something else. So that's it. Any questions? So, yes. Fact, this is to be mostly used for unit testing. Is that what you Right, yeah, yeah. J unit is, is designed mostly.
Any other questions? You didn't see. Well, yeah. 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 I need either a question or an applause. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep, yep.